Well, good morning or afternoon, everyone. We are so glad that you have joined us today for the sixth and final session of our 2024 Tennessee Farmers Market Vendor Bootcamp webinar series. I'm Megan Lefew, and I'm an Extension Specialist in Value Added Agriculture Marketing with the Center for Profitable Agriculture. We work with farmers and develop educational materials and programs for farmers who are interested in value added uh, processing, packaging, direct marketing, and agritourism. We are really glad that you have joined us for this series. I have learned a lot, and I always learn something new when Kyla speaks, especially because we get a lot of great questions. Um, so we're looking forward to that today. Kyla is going to be speaking about Tennessee food manufacturing regulations, talking about cottage food laws, but also some of the regulations beyond that in case you choose to to follow those uh, other regulations or if the cottage food laws won't allow you to produce uh, what you're considering. So Kyla Adkins is uh, our guest speaker today and she is with our UT Extension Food Science Department. Um, before I give her a little bit more introduction, I do want to remind you all that we will leave our videos and the um, microphones off and on mute today, please use the chat box to uh, or the Q&A box to share any questions that you have, and we will do our best to get to as many of those as we possibly can, um, or we will uh, research answers if, if we don't know quite what, what to tell you on those. Um, so uh, Kyla is an extension assistant for the University of Tennessee Extension Food Science Department. She joined the department in this role in 2022, but she was previously part of that department as a student where she graduated with her degree in food science in 2019. Previously, she worked as a food safety specialist with Steratech inspecting restaurants and other food safe service operations. And her responsibilities at UT include providing regulatory guidance for existing food manufacturers and food entrepreneurs, which is part of what she's doing today, managing the Food Entrepreneur Assistance Program, and working with youth to develop an understanding of what food science is and what's important. So Kyla, we are so excited to have you with us today. I know we have questions already brewing for you. So we look <laughs> forward to hearing what these regulations are and then diving into some specifics of, of some products that folks have in mind. So I'll turn it over to you. Sounds good. I'm and you are welcome to put your video on or off however you are comfortable. I'm just going to flash it on real quick because I have the worst camera issues, I feel like. So, hello, everyone. And it is freezing, so we'll just pop it back off. Thank you for that introduction. So, let's get started with Tennessee food manufacturing regulations, cottage foods, and more. Like Megan had mentioned, there's a good chance that the good majority of you will be our quote unquote cottage food producers, but just in the off chance that some of you are looking to switch into commercial processing, you're curious what that might look like, what the differences are, or you are needing to because you have just outsold, you can't quite make it work in your domestic kitchen anymore, or you're looking to make a product that is ineligible under the Tennessee Food Freedom Act, this will be a great little introduction into what the world of commercial manufacturing will look like. And just as always, this is for educational purposes. We are not legal advice, and it's not intended to be a substitute for the services of a competent legal professional. Let's go ahead and start with our cottage foods processing. If you'll notice, cottage foods is in quotation marks. We're trying to start to slowly steer the ship away from cottage foods, even though it's a very much so well-known term still, um, and we are switching into Tennessee Food Freedom Act producers in the state of Tennessee. July 1st, 2022, the world was kind of rocked for those of us um, in food processing in Tennessee and Tennessee producers because we had a pretty massive law change. 
prior to July 1st, 2022, we were more so under that cottage food laws. And with a cottage food law, products had to be non-potentially hazardous. Products could be produced pretty much anywhere in the state without requiring permitting or inspection by Tennessee Department of Ag. And producers could only sell directly to consumers in the state of Tennessee. There were no full-time employees allowed. Everyone had to do this as a little side gig, a part-time job. Producers also had to follow good manufacturing practices. You'll hear us refer to those as GMPs. Products had specific labeling requirements, and producers also had to allow inspection by agencies charged with enforcing food safety laws. Those would be people like the Department of Ag and the Department of Health. With that law change, we did still have some things that were able to stay the same. So products still can be only sold directly to consumers or online within the state. We've got to stay within those state lines. It's a state law. We're not quite pushing out into those federal regulations. Once we go outside of the state, we become a federal regulated producer. So especially for our bordering counties, that doesn't mean that we can step over that state line into farmers markets in Kentucky or Virginia. We've got to stay with our in-state farmers markets. We still have to allow regulators access to the private residents if needed to ensure food safety. That's going to come up if public health is a concern. They might need to inspect your home residence. In the unfortunate and hopefully not going to happen incident of a um, foodborne disease or illness outbreak. Restaurants and other food service establishments cannot use homemade products. Our restaurants, our food trucks, um, things of that nature, they have to use approved licensed in inspected food products when they are making the foods that they're selling to the public. That is part of the Tennessee Department of Health Health Code that specifically calls that out. With the nature of our Tennessee Food Freedom Act products, because they are not licenses, they are not permitted, none of that, that makes our Tennessee Food Freedom Act products ineligible to be used in restaurants. So our major changes that came about with the introduction of the Tennessee Food Freedom Act, the law now refers to homemade food items. So a little bit of a definition switch there. Homemade food items are foods, including a non-alcoholic beverage, which is produced and if packaged, packaged at the private residence of the producer. We also changed from non-potentially hazardous to non-time and temperature control for safety foods. You'll hear us refer to those as TCS foods pretty commonly. TCS foods cannot contain meat, fish, or poultry. Custom orders and third-party sales are now allowed. So with the introduction of that, producers can now wholesale their products. If you have a little local knickknack store or like a home goods store, they are now eligible to carry your products in store in the state and sell those. We have no limitations on employees. So if you want to make this your full-time job, you now have the power to do so. If you have a really booming business and you're looking to employ people in your county or family members, you are now also able to do so. And we've got some new labeling requirements specifically for identifying the producer. We've got some more details on that. An important note about this last point especially is that the labeling requirements not only apply to our new producers who have come in under the Tennessee Food Freedom Act, but it also applies to our previous cottage food producers. Before we get started really delving into the law, we like to explain what non-TCS versus TCS foods are because this tends to be one of the first, can I do it, can I do it under the Food Freedom Act. So time and temperature control for safety foods are easily and quickly able to grow bacteria when they are held at specific temperatures and times. By limiting the time and temperature of these foods, it means limiting pathogenic microorganism growth or toxin formation. 
We use two common parameters to determine if a food is TCS or non-TCS. Those are water activity and pH. Just as a general thought process, if you're trying to figure out if your product can be TCS, non-TCS, if it can be made under the Food Freedom Act or if it is ineligible. If it requires refrigeration, it's TCS and is not allowed under the Food Freedom Act. Our non-TCS products are typically shelf stable. With the point of it requiring refrigeration, those are gonna be things like milk, cheeses, fresh chopped up salsa. Those are things that require refrigeration in order for those to be safe. If you make a loaf of bread and you think it tastes better in the fridge or for quality and production reasons, you ought to keep it in the freezer. That is not a requirement. That is your choice. That's more of a quality. I personally like my cakes and my cupcakes cold, so I put them in the refrigerator. That would be a quality choice. Things like uh, compound butters, those sorts require refrigeration. That would be an ineligible product. Here is a table that was pulled from the Tennessee Department of Ag when they are defining the difference between a TCS food and a non-TCS food. This is a table for the interaction of pH and water activity for controlling spores in foods heat treated to destroy vegetative cells and then subsequently packaged. If you have a barbecue sauce that you're making or you're looking to make under the Tennessee Food Freedom Act and you've tested the pH or you've had a lab test the pH and that pH is let's say around a 4.4 and you've also tested the water activity or had a lab test it and they know that the water activity is a 0.93 we're going to use our table to then determine that it is a non-TCS food. And that can be used for other products like sauces, um, hot sauces, things of that nature. That is when we start to refer to this table. Because that would be for foods heat treated and packaged. Another table also from the Tennessee Department of Ag is for the interaction of pH and water activity for the control of foods not heat treated or heat treated but not packaged. This could be for your confectionery items like your cookies, your cakes, um, mayonnaise maybe even potentially depending on what you're making. And again, just this table is for our foods not heat treated or heat treated and not packaged. I feel like the majority of the time we tend to refer to this table. If you'll notice, it has a little bit more specific pH and it definitely has more specific water activity values with baked goods and things of that nature. A lot of times you'll hear us throw out the water activity value of 0 0.85 instead of 0 0.88. We love a little bit of wiggle room in food science because that allows for some just natural variation that tends to occur. If you're product is good with a water activity of less than 0.85, you should be good no matter what. If it's 0.88, you start to teeter on that line of potentially becoming a TCS food and therefore unallowed. Here are some different ways that you can test your products or use proven recipes and sources in order to make what could potentially be a TCS food, a non-TCS food. So in the Department of Food Science and Extension, we offer pH testing and water activity testing. pH meters are pretty easily available online. Amazon has some options at different price points. An important thing is to know how to properly use your pH meter and to calibrate it before you start testing pHs. Water activity meters tend to be a little bit more pricey, so we offer that testing at a low rate. And for our producers who are making heat-treated and packaged foods like barbecue sauces um, or even canned green beans are now allowed under the Tennessee Food Freedom Act, we heavily, heavily encourage the use of a validated source like the Ball Book of Canning 
or you can reach out to us as a process authority and we can evaluate your product and give you a recommendation as to a process that would become shelf stable and non TCS. Some examples of products allowed and not allowed. This is nine times out of 10 what people want to hear is just what can I make, what can I not make. Things that are allowed under the Tennessee Food Freedom Act include things like dried pasta, muffins, spice blends, and then canned fruits, jams, jellies, canned salsa, canned pickled vegetables, canned vegetables, canned barbecue sauce. If you're looking and you're thinking, I don't want to put my barbecue sauce in a mason jar, I want to put it in a nice, we call them woozy bottles. When talking about canning, we really just mean thermally processing to be shelf stable. Now, obviously, some things like a canned vegetable that is going to look more like a common mason jar, but your barbecue sauces, your hot sauces, things like that, we're really just talking about that thermal processing, especially with our canned vegetables, our canned sauces, barbecue sauces all of those things, we really do like to look back at a validated source or a process authority because no one wants to have the scary word botulism in their product and then make people really sick. Some products not allowed would include cooked pasta, cupcakes with cream filling, fresh garlic and oil, cut or sliced cantaloupe, fresh salsa, pickled or preserved eggs, and fresh sliced vegetables. For cupcakes with cream filling, if you're looking and thinking, but that doesn't sound very unsafe. That one is a tricky one. It tends to tiptoe on a line of TCS or non-TCS. Cream filling can possibly be non-TCS. We really need product testing, though, to check the water activity level. That tends to be our deciding factor. Buttercream is the same situation. Buttercream can be TCS or non-TCS. And it pretty much tends to boil down to is that water activity above or below 0.88. Again, we like to use 0.85 just because of some natural variation that tends to occur. Other allowed foods include fermented foods that would be non-alcoholic ferments only, dried products. This includes air or freeze dried products, excluding meat and egg products, non-alcoholic beverages, and they have to be shelf-stable only, shelf-stable salad dressing, and your other confections such, such as candy, chocolates, and fudge. Some other products that are not allowed would be anything with meat, fish, or poultry, including jerky. I know I touched on this with dried products. Meat, fish, and poultry are USDA inspected and regulated products, and they have a very tight hold on those. So those are products that are immediately ineligible for Tennessee Food Freedom Act, even using those things as a varnish. So if you wanted to make a bread with, let's say, cheese and pepperoni, or you wanted to top your confections with some crumbled bacon, that is still considered not allowed because it does contain meats, etc. And USDA does still have regulations even on even on short or small percentages. Any products requiring refrigeration or freezing, again that refers back to our definition of TCS versus non-TCS. Products requiring refrigeration or freezing tend to be our TCS products. Products with over 0.5% alcohol. Once we go above 0.5% alcohol, we delve into Tennessee Alcoholic Beverage Commission, and they have a tight regulation over those products as well. So for our producers looking to make tinctures, vanilla extracts, et cetera, things of that nature, you do have to coordinate that with the Tennessee Alcoholic and Beverage Commission. All dairy products, including pimento cheese, again, that tends to be just the nature of a TCS food. Caramel apples with sticks. Piercing the skin with a stick has caused foodborne illnesses in the past, so we consider that a not allowed product. And cold brewed coffee. Some different scenarios that we tend to commonly run into when people are deciding if they are TCS or non-TCS, 
if they can make this product under the Food Freedom Act or if they are not able to. Cupcakes is a really popular one. We tend to have a lot of bakers and cake makers who see the scenario or the specific point about buttercream or cream cheese frostings or different fillings. And Miss Bonnie is one of those. She's not sure where to start, so she reaches out to us or she can ask herself if she wants to use frosting on her cupcakes and if so, what type of frosting. If it's buttercream, then we really should be having the water activity tested to make sure that it's considered non-TCS to be allowed. If she doesn't want to use frosting, then her product generally should just be good to go under the Food Freedom Act since it should be considered non-TCS. We do have some very basic parameters for buttercream and cream cheese frosting if it would be TCS or non-TCS, and that is all dependent on the percent by weight sugar. We can share those recipes with you all if you reach out and are interested in those. If you wanna see if your recipe is eligible just as it stands now, you're more than welcome to send those to our lab and we can test those. Vanilla extract, I touched on this one. It's just a really popular one right now that we're getting a lot of questions about. So with vanilla extract, it's tend to be produced by soaking vanilla beans in some version of an alcohol. Because the finished product most definitely has more than 0.5% alcohol by volume, it is regulated by the Tennessee Alcohol and Beverage Commission. That means it is not allowed under the Tennessee Food Freedom Act. Pickles. Not quite reached popularity yet with the Tennessee Food Freedom Act, but it's probably coming any day now. Legally, now you can make pickles under the Food Freedom Act. Previously, we, you were unable to. So if a producer is looking to produce and sell pickles, we have to meet two requirements. First, we have to make, the, make sure that the pH is below 4.6. If it's above 4.6, pretty much automatically, it's going to be considered a TCS product and then also we need to make sure that they have been correctly thermally processed using a water bath. Part of that is making sure again that we are killing off all of our botulism, potential spores that we have in a product, and just making sure that foods are safe to sell to our neighbors and fellow Tennesseans. Green beans, again, that is now a product that is considered allowed under the Tennessee Food Freedom Act, can green beans are. So if you're a producer and you are now jumping for joy because you can sell your canned green beans at a farmer's market, a few different things that we want to make sure are happening to, in order to prevent Clostridium botulinum. We really, again, heavily encourage the use of a verified source in their recipes. Those can be the USDA Complete Guide to Home Canning, the Ball Book of Home Preserving, or you can contact us. We do not do low acid food product work, but we can get you in contact with other extension land grant universities that do that work and they are more than happy to help you. Homemade spaghetti sauce. This is a funky one because it's all going to be dependent on pH and also if he has any meat in it. So if your producer ho has homemade spaghetti sauce, we've got two different options for you. If your pH is less than 4.6, it can be processed using water bath canning to be shelf stable. If we have a pH of greater than 4.6, it will need pressure canning to be shelf stable. Low acid foods, those foods with a pH greater than 4.6, require pressure canning generally. And then those foods with a pH of less than 4.6, we consider those acidified foods or even potentially a formulated acid food. And those are processed using water bath canning to be shelf stable. Either way, that homemade sauce can be sold under the Tennessee Food Freedom Act as long as it has no meat. Once we introduce meat into our spaghetti sauce, we then become ineligible to be a Tennessee Food, Food, Food Freedom Act product. Another big component of the Tennessee Food Freedom Act are the labeling requirements. 
Labeling requirements for the Tennessee Food Freedom Act are laid out in black and white, and they are that the producer information is required. That includes things like your name, your home address, and your telephone number, the common or usual name of the product, ingredients in descending order based on weight, and the following statement, this product was produced at a private residence that is exempt from state licensing and inspection. This product may contain allergens. With our home address information, it has to be the home address and your phone number. There are no other options under the Food Freedom Act. A common question that we get is if I can use a PO box, PO boxes are not our home address. And again, the law strictly lays out that it has to be the home address. Reason for this is in case of the unfortunate incident that there is a foodborne illness or a foodborne disease outbreak. Regulators and Department of Health employees, Department of Ag employees need to be able to figure out where a product has come from to contact the producer to one, investigate, and then two, to let the producer know so that way they can get a hold of other customers, get the word out that there is potentially an issue with this product. Here's an example of what a label could look like. So let's say that we have our pickled beets that we've made. We've got our common usual name of pickled beets right up there at the top. If you want to call your product some fun, fancy name, you're more than welcome to, but we do have to have its common usual name so people know what they're buying. Ingredients by weight. Generally, beets are going to be your heaviest, your most abundant, and then sugar, apple cider vinegar, and water. We've got that exact statement about the product being produced at a private residence that's exempt from state licensing and inspection, that it may contain allergens. And then on the back, we have who it was made by. It was made by Mr. Bob Neeland with his phone number and his address. Second part of labeling is it has specific requirements to where the information has to go. So labeling information must be on a label if it is packaged or sold in bulk. It has to be attached to the product if it's packaged individually or if we are selling it in bulk. The label has to be attached to the bulk container of the product it is being sold from. It can also be on a placard displayed at the point of sale if the product is not packaged or sold from a bulk container. Labeling information can be on a website where the product is sold if it is only sold online. And if the product is sold by telephone or custom order, the seller must inform the consumer that the product is produced at a private residence that is exempt from state licensing and inspection. With all those different labeling possibilities, we have been getting questions if I can just link to a website on a business card, if I can use a QR code, if I can just post it on my social media account and not have to have that labeling information present on a sticker label attached to the product. QR codes, website links, social media, none of those are allowed. Again, we can only have it on the website if we only sell it through the website. Once we take that product and put it in um, stores as part of a wholesaler or farmer's markets, we are no longer able to use that website option and no QR codes, no other options are available other than what you see on this slide. Some good manufacturing practices because I firmly believe that all home food processors should be using our good manufacturing practices. These are ones that should translate pretty easily for home food processors. We always want to use food grade utensils, equipment, cleaners, sanitizers, packaging materials, and ingredients. Sounds pretty common sense, I feel like. We want to make sure that the workspace and equipment is clean and sanitized. We want to exclude pets from our workspaces. We also want to close our bathroom doors, outer doors, and if possible, your kitchen door. And then again, pretty obvious, no pests, please, while we're making products for others.
two examples of when it's time to toss out some of your equipment. Our cutting board's looking pretty grubby. We've got some deep scratches with some leftover food particles in those scratches. That's what turns them all brown and orange and black and gunky. It's time for that to go. Once we have cut deep into a cutting board, bacteria can harbor there and no amount of cleaning and sanitizing is going to get all the way deep down into those scratch groove marks. And then our knife, it's also looking pretty rough. I don't know exactly what's happened to it, but once that metal has been compromised, metal can start to flake off into product. And unfortunately, we can get shards of knife metal in products. And I don't think anyone quite wants that to happen. So that would also be the time for that knife to be tossed out. Also part of our GMPs, we want to make sure we're washing our hands, have a little personal hygiene check, make sure hair is pulled back, that we're clean. We recommend that there's no jewelry on the hands just because jewelry can harbor and we also tend to not wash our hands quite to our full potential when we have on jewelry because we don't want it to get wet and soapy and all those different things. We always encourage refraining from domestic duties while making your product. Things like changing dirty diapers or making food for your family. When we're making food for our family and going back and forth between that and producing our products, there is a chance that allergens that are not listed on the label can be introduced. We don't want that to happen if we can help it. So try to carve out a time for when you're making your food free to match products that are separate from preparing food from your family. We also recommend having a thermometer inside your refrigerator and freezer. It's nice to know when your refrigerator and freezer has went out and those food products need to be thrown away because they have been outside of our temperature safe zone. Also a good thing with that is you can now see when your own personal products have been compromised and you can also toss them out. So it's kind of like a little freebie for your own use. And then also proper waste disposal. We don't want to encourage pests. And we also just want to make sure that we keep a nice clean environment. Some common questions that we tend to get pretty regularly. Probably touched on most of these, but just really nice to hammer at home. No PO boxes on labels instead of an address. Again, that is laid out black and white in the Tennessee Food Freedom Act. I get a lot of questions over the phone. If I really do have to list all the ingredients in my food products, can I just list the allergens? I don't want to list my sub ingredients. Nope, everything in the product has to be listed. If you're using chocolate chips, when you put chocolate chips in your ingredient list, we've got to list all the ingredients in our chocolate chips. Again, we're getting a lot of questions here lately, it feels like, about vanilla extracts and tinctures. That is a no, because the alcohol content is over 0.5%. That is going to be regulated by the Tennessee Alcoholic uh, Beverage Commission. And then we've also been getting some questions about freeze-dried eggs. And we have been told that egg products are not allowed under the Tennessee Food Freedom Act. Now, if you're using eggs in your batters for your cookies and cupcakes and cakes, that is allowed because it is an ingredient and further processing, as in the baking, keeps the egg from being concerned when it is TCS versus non-TCS. So eggs as an ingredient, A-okay. Eggs as a product, not quite A-okay. All of that is for our Tennessee Food Freedom Act producers. So if you've heard all that and I've either gave you some really sad news that you can't make a product as a Tennessee Food Freedom Act producer or you knew all that and your business is just really ramping up and it's time to become a commercial food processor, we're going to go into a little bit of what that can potentially look like. First off, right off the bat, the difference in some areas for commercial food processors they are licensed and permitted. They must work out of an inspected kitchen. They also must register with the FDA for the Bioterrorism Act. Commercial food processors 
may require additional education slash certification depending on product. One great example of that is acidified food processors must have a BPCS certification. BPCS is known as Better Processing Control School. That is a course that we offer in food science. And there's also specific labeling requirements for commercial food processors. That looks a little bit different than our Tennessee Food Freedom Act processors. They could potentially need a nutrition facts panel that is going to depend on the amount of sales and full-time employees. And if we're making any nutrition claims, such as low sugar, fat-free, heart healthy, et cetera. When is a commercial facility required? When is it required for you to become a commercial food manufacturer? If you're starting to expand into large scale food manufacturing, it kind of just organically happens because you are not able to keep up with supply and demand from your own home kitchen. If your hot sauce or your barbecue sauce is just really delicious and you've got some restaurants that want to use that, you would then need to become a commercial food manufacturer if you want to sell your product to restaurants and other manufacturers. Once we cross state lines, we have to become a commercial food manufacturer. That's whenever FDA is going to also become part of your regulating body. If we are producing products prohibited under the Tennessee Food Freedom Act, we've got to become a commercial food manufacturer. If you're looking to make some beef jerky, some extracts, some tinctures, egg products, etc., we have to become a commercial food manufacturer. Most retail chains are going to require a commercial production facility and a third party audit. So if you've been producing under the Tennessee Food Freedom Act and you're really wanting to step into Kroger's or Walmart's, generally they're going to require you be a commercial food manufacturer. One, because those are nationwide chains and they're probably not gonna take on something that's only sold in Tennessee. And then also the inspections and licensing and permitting that comes with becoming a commercial food manufacturer. It's a little bit more strict. There's a little bit more oversight. And just as part of the national chain, that's them keeping their brand. And then again, producing products prohibited under the Tennessee Food Freedom Act. It's on there twice. Just because of those vanilla extracts and tinctures and beef jerky products that we keep getting, we've got to become a commercial food manufacturer if we want to pursue those businesses. Licensing and permitting is required when you are a commercial food manufacturer because it is a highly regulated business. When you're in Tennessee, you will have the Tennessee Department of Agriculture as part of your regulating body. They do licensing and permitting based on the size of the facility and the risk level of the product. And then, of course, that comes with different costs for those licensing and permitting. You could potentially be working with the Department of Health. If you're looking to cross state lines, you're also going to have the FDA for most foods and beverages, bottled water, and on the off chance that you're a food additive manufacturer, you'll also be working with the FDA. If you're someone who's looking to make any sort of meat, poultry, egg products, beef jerky, or your spaghetti sauce, you now want to add some meat into it, you would also be under the USDA. FDA facilities are required to have food safety plans. There are some exemptions for small processors. And then also once we become an FDA facility, we have a periodic inspection. Our USDA facilities require HACCP plans and an inspector on the premise. Process authority for our acidified and formulated acid food pro processors. Acidified food processors are required to work with a process authority to establish a scheduled process. Sometimes you'll hear us refer to this as a process letter. And then once that work has been done with the process authority and you have your process letter, you will have to file the 2541E form with the FDA, and that's for each product and each different container size. 
So if you have a hot sauce or a barbecue sauce that is determined to be an acidified food and you have it in a 12 ounce and a 16 ounce bottle, we'll have to file that 2541E for not only the 12 ounce, but the 16 ounce, even if it is the exact same product. The Tennessee Department of Ag also requires a process letter for our acidified food processors, even if you are not wanting to sell outside of the state lines, if you just want to stay within the state. Formulated acid food processors, even if you're wanting to stay within the state as a commercial food manufacturer, the TDA does require proof that the product is a formulated acid and the process is adequate to be shelf stable. The FDA does not require require a form comparable to the 2541E for formulated acid food processors, but you do need to make sure that you are a formulated acid food processor because that is some tricky work and you could potentially be an acidified food processor without even knowing it. If you've listened to all this and you're wondering where can I even find a process authority, great news, Food Science Extension, we are a process authority. We can get that work done for you. You can visit our website and we have sample submission forms to fill out and send to us with your product. Different types of kitchens for commercial um, food processors. A domestic kitchen is a kitchen on a private residence. A commercial kitchen, the facility is designed to meet sanitary standards, such as an appropriate layout, plumbing, and surfaces that are safe for food production. Then we also have a community kitchen. Those tend to be shared use commercial kitchens. Domestic kitchen is on here for a type of kitchen. One, because that's what our Tennessee Food Freedom Act producers are using, but then also it is possible for a domestic kitchen to become a licensed and inspected commercial kitchen. Before we start construction on a domestic kitchen in our home or a kitchen on our property, however, we need to reach out to the Tennessee Department of Ag before starting any construction, remodeling, conversion, any of that, because the plans have to be submitted to the T to TDA before we start any construction, remodeling, or conversion, and the Food establishment construction cannot begin until TDA has completed their review and given approval. We've heard stories of people spending thousands and thousands of dollars to get a kitchen on their home property renovated to what they think is needed. And TDA has had to come in and give them the unfortunate news that something was done incorrectly. They've not done enough of something. They've done something wrong or that something wasn't needed and that's just money wasted. So again, not only are you required to reach out to TDA before we start converting a domestic kitchen into a commercial kitchen, but also they want to help you not waste money. Commercial kitchen can also be referred to as a commercial processing facility with our community kitchens that can be a much more cost effective route to go for, especially for those who are Tennessee Food Freedom Act producers switching into commercial processing, or you're really wanting to make a product that's not approved. Community kitchens tend to have resources behind them for processors. And then also Tennessee Department of Ag does tend to have a discount for producers who work out of a community kitchen versus building a commercial kitchen. Some facility considerations when it comes to a commercial kitchen include the facility design, equipment, plumbing, lighting and electrical systems, pest management, storage and warehouse, waste management, and ventilation. And this is what a nice commercial kitchen can look like or a community kitchen. Good news is the Tennessee Department of Ag has a map of listed and approved community kitchens on their website which then allows you all to look based on your zip code in your city to find a commercial kitchen near you if you would like to work out at a commercial kitchen. And that is what I have prepared for and shared today. If you would like some more contact, 
or information about anything that we've talked about or any names that I've mentioned, Dr. Morgan is our extension specialist in the process authority. There is his phone number and his email. My name is on there as extension assistant with my phone number and email. And then the food science department's phone number, email, and website for extension work. That includes if you need to take the VPCS course as an acidified food producer, or if you need to have your products sent to us for any sort of water activity testing, pH testing, process authority work, that website has a link and all that can be found on our website. Thank you. Do I have any questions? Thank you, Kyla. That was very informative and I love all the examples that you have sprinkled through there. It really helps us uh, to um, figure that out. Perfect. Glad to hear. <laughs> so Jeremiah has a question about rabbit meat. Um, so Jeremiah, um, I, I will try to answer, and I don't know if Elena is on here. She may be able to try to answer as well. Um, rabbit meat <laughs> is, rabbit and quail are considered non-immutable livestock. So we get questions about those two quite often. There are others as well. The, the regulations are a little bit difficult to understand. Those can be regulated by the Food and Drug Administration or through a voluntary grant of inspection by the USDA. But what we're being told is that USDA will not provide a voluntary grant of inspection um, unless you have a, a typical grant of inspection. So if you're not a USDA processor for somebody else. So Tennessee requires you to be some uh, under some process of authority. Um, the problem is that we don't have a good <laughs> contact. We don't have clear information on, from FDA on how to do it. There is a USDA inspected plant in Tennessee that will um, process chickens. I don't think they will uh, process rabbit, but we could check on that to see um, if that were an option. And we are currently working and have been for quite a while trying to get the um, get the regulations for that. So um, Jeremiah, if, if you will email me, we'll keep you in the loop as we try to unravel that. Kyla, do you see the questions about extracts and bitters? Who do we contact for being able to sell those? Yes, I saw that one. So we are actively reaching out to, and I always get their name a little bit mixed, mixed up. It's the Tennessee Alcoholic and Beverage Commission. It might be Trade Commission. We are reaching out to them to try to figure out, to give producers a clear cut answer. As of right now, we do not have a good contact Hopefully in the near future, we will. We do know that definitely extracts and bitters are under um, the Alcohol Beverage Trade Commission. We just don't know who the contact is for that. But again, we're working on that. We can get your information from Megan and get further contact with you or anyone else who is interested once we do find a clear cut path for people who are looking to make extracts and bitters. And then I saw a question about guidelines available for selling dehydrated foods, ones that do not include meat. We in UT's food science extension do not currently have any guidelines, except that the water activity needs to be below 0 0.88, because once we reach a water activity less than that, it is considered non-TCS, it's considered shelf stable. There are other Langrant University food science extension departments who have some really great resources and some really great papers. I can also get your information from Megan and share those with you if you would like. Yes, that would be great. Or if you wanted to shoot um, Kyla an email, um, yes. then she could respond directly. That would be great. And then can local extension offices help locate a facility to check water activity? We are able to check water activity. So our costs as of currently are 
$35. Yes, $35 per sample slash per food product. And with that, we will type up a letter that explains what the water activity level is that you can then share with any sort of farmer's market that may be asking for the water activity level of your product, just to verify that it's non-TCS. You can share that with regulatory bodies such as Tennessee Department of Ag, Tennessee Department of Health, et cetera. And that letter should hold as long as you do not change your recipe. Once we start to adjust the um, percent or the weights or the ingredients, there is no guarantee that that water activity level is the same. So just something to take note of, but yes, our department and your local extension office should be pointing you to us and we can test that and get back to you pretty quickly. And I see a question about a blueberry farm. In the past, they've been able to sell blueberry chest pies with eggs being in it. Can you still sell that? Yes, you can still sell the um, chest pie because egg is an ingredient and it's not through that baking process. We're not selling something like freeze-dried eggs or a freeze-dried omelet or pickled eggs. Those are more so the type of egg products that are considered um, not allowed under the Tennessee Food Freedom Act, but using eggs as an ingredient for things like cakes, cookies, pies, et cetera, those should be allowed. There shouldn't be any issue with that as long as you're properly baking them. These are all very good, great questions and clarifications. And Kyla has shared her slides with me, so I'll be sure to send those out in a follow-up email. So you'll have those notes along with the, the recording as well. And her um, email address, she's a, a great resource and uh, has a lot of contacts as well. We don't always have all the answers, but we try to <laughs> try to dig them up when we when we are able to. Hopefully we'll have answers for extracts and tinctures and bitters soon. That's a goal. That is a big goal we have right now. Jeremiah has one last question, I think. Okay. And we and we have plenty of time, so we will yes. stick around as long as anybody has questions, especially the next uh, five or 10 minutes. Only the dehydrated fruit requires water activity versus freeze dried, correct? <laughs> so, with both of those, dehydrated and water activity, the controlling factor for both of those products, really, no matter if it's fruit, vegetables, um, anything that you're looking to dehydrate or freeze dry, dehydrated mushrooms. The controlling factor on that is always going to be a water activity level. And with that, it's about properly dehydrating and freeze drying those products that you're looking to produce. So both of them require um, water activity as its control and to make sure that it's below 0.88. Again, we like to use 0.85 just for some wiggle room, especially when you're dehydrating or freeze drying what we consider like a raw agricultural commodity, some mushrooms, things of that sort, just because they're natural, there's no processing. It's not like we're dehydrating a Skittle, where a Skittle's always going to be the same. Mushrooms and fruits and vegetables naturally have some variation. So a big thing with that is just making sure that they are done so properly. You can absolutely send um, those to us and we can grind them down and test them in our water activity meter. And that way you can know if your process needs just a little bit longer or whatnot. And yes, nothing requires water activity measurement, but just for you to be certain and make sure that you're safe, we offer that. Dr. Morgan is in the chat as well, making sure that I'm on top of my game and answering questions. That's an excellent point, Dr. Morgan. We we uh, definitely suggest some risk management procedures. So that's a good way to 
make sure that you're under compliance and keeping everything safe. And we're very glad that our Goose Science Department is able to help folks um, make that measurement. Well, if there are not any more questions at this time, I thank you, Kyla, so much for this presentation and for taking the time to prepare and be with us today. And thank you to all the participants who have joined us. Um, this, this has been very valuable to me, and I hope that it has to you and uh, your questions have helped a lot with that. Uh, we'll follow up with email and you know how to find us in the future if we can be of further assistance.